Beaver Dam, Wisconsin's got peppers in a stage. Beaver Dam, Kentucky's where Bill Monroe first played. Beaver Dam, anywhere the people all say, have a gosh dang beaver darn great damn day. Welcome to the Great Beaver Fiasco. We're back again. I know you thought we may be self-destructed, but we somehow have taken the timbers and rebuilt the lodge. And in fact, we are in a new studio setting. But before we talk about that, I am one of your hosts to this YouTube show and podcast, Thomas Rayfeld. I am L.A. Bass. And I'm Craig Warmbold. And we have a lot more color behind us here, Craig. There is a tapestry here. There's a painting of some space flowers L.A. has uh, some flowers above a jar painting above her. Yeah, nice Where green background. Where are we exactly? We want to thank uh, uh, Chris Schumacher with uh, Art on the Town for uh, providing us some uh, studio space to record our podcast above her Art on the Town studio, which is the foremost location to go in the city of Beaver Dam and really anywhere in south central Wisconsin uh, to uh, indulge in your favorite artistic endeavors, painting, pottery, whatever it may be. Art on the Town. Also want to thank uh, Chris for sponsoring our Big Gnaw, which is coming up a little bit later. And the theme of it is going to be art, culture, and its impact on downtown revitalization, which ties in so well with our special guest, Annette Camps, founding member of the Beaver Dam Mary Community Theater. It is quite uh, serendipitous, and you're not going to want to miss this conversation coming up. L.A., if anyone has missed Episode 1 or Episode 2 of The Great Beaver Fiasco, where can they find us on our socials and YouTube? Well, on YouTube, we are the Supper Club Media Channel. And on Facebook and Instagram, it's The Great Beaver Fiasco. So make sure to like us, follow us, and always keep us in your hearts and minds. Have we had any uh, exciting posts on any of our social media lately, L.A.? We have had some exciting posts. We've also had some exciting comments. Thank you, Fred Morrow, for always checking in with us and letting us know that you're learning more about beavers than you ever thought you would know. And we do have a new fan. Really? Yes. Tell us about it. Not only is he my great nephew, but he is a great nephew. Ari, thank you for helping us to uh, to get the word out and uh, just being the best fan you can be of the Great Beaver Fiasco. Oh, we'll Thank call you, him Ari. the uh, Great Beaver Fiasco nephew. Huh? You get it? Great nephew, great beaver. I do. All right, Thomas, back to you. Thank you for that awkward yeah. transition there, Thank Craig. You. I really appreciate Anytime. that. With that, why don't we start off with a check of our damn news. We begin in Wisconsin with the firefighters who were involved in that recent hovercraft mishap that took place during an ice training exercise on Beaver Dam Lake. Now, two of the three injured were treated and released from the hospital right away, while the third was airlifted from the scene, spent two days in the hospital before being able to return home. Now, it may be some time before all three are back on the job, all of us here at the Great Beaver Fiasco just want to say that we are grateful uh, for their service to the community and certainly for the service of all of the firefighters uh, that are out there giving of themselves and risking their lives to make sure the community is safe. In other news, scientists uh, and stakeholders from western Alaska and northern Canada will be gathering in Fairbanks at the end of February to discuss the migration and expansion of beavers into the Arctic. With that story, our Arctic wildlife reporter... Thomas Rayfeld. Well, I got frostbite on uh, eight of my 10 appendages, but it was worth it to get this story correct because the Arctic Beaver Observation Network is going to be looking at issues caused by beavers damming up Arctic streams in Alaska and other Arctic regions. Now, the issue is that dams create ponds. Ponds thaw permafrost, and then the carbon that would have otherwise remained locked in place and undisturbed permafrost is released and that released carbon alters stream ecology. University of Alaska Fairbanks Associate Professor Ken Tape says, beavers affect the resources that a given landscape supports. Tape has been researching the impact of the beaver's northern migration for several years. Research by Tape and his group, published in 2018, includes observations indicating beaver movement from forest into tundra of western and northwestern Alaska 
and northwestern Canada, changing travel routes and access for subsistence hunting and fishing. The meeting will also, Craig and L.A., cover how beaver engineering is affecting fish, water quality, biodiversity, permafrost, and wildfires. Tape tells AlaskaNativeNews.com that, quote, without a clear understanding of this issue, there is no way to know what an Arctic stream corridor will look like in 20 years when beavers arrive or if they're already there. Wow, beaver engineering. thats I wasn't even able to get into any engineering classes in college. I just wasn't smart enough. It's amazing that this rodent is able to pull that off. Turns out all you need is a tail and a big uh, set of teeth. Well, there you go. It's weird that, you know, in some parts of the world, uh, beavers are being reintroduced to help uh, facilitate the growth of wildlife and some situations that they may be having over there. Uh, California, we just reported on a story recently. Other parts of the world like this, they're like, "Uh uh-oh, the beavers are coming. We we need to take action. Taking action with this locally Arctic Stream Corridor is our wildlife reporter, L.A. Bass. L.A.? Coming from Norway, it looks like artificial intelligence is able to tell beavers apart by a fingerprint type pattern on their tails. According to a study published this week in Ecology and Evolution, a computer algorithm can accurately identify individual beavers by their lizard-like scales. This might be good news for the Eurasian beaver, which was practically hunted into extinction in the 1800s. Researchers monitoring their recovery have been using ear tags and radio collars in estimating the size of populations, but ear tags and radio collars can stress beavers out. So scientists trained artificial intelligence with a skill program to detect patterns on images of tails from 100 Eurasian beavers that had been hunted in Norway. The effort was 96% accurate at telling the animals apart. The scientists examined photographs taken in laboratory settings with good lighting, but they say the AI approach should work with images taken in the wild. Wow, yeah, you don't want to you don't want to freak out the beavers. No, That's... I know. There's enough stress, I'm sure, with building the dams and eating wood. <laughs> right. But that is interesting. How do you measure beaver stress? Mm. I don't yeah. know because that would probably stress them out anyway. So it's kind of like a vicious circle. I mean, right. if they were being observed to begin with. Yeah, the vicious beaver circle. That's right. Wow. <laughs> this out of uh, Minnesota, Grand Marais, Minnesota, the local historic Beaver House Bait Shop will become the location of the municipality's city-owned liquor store. All right, you might not have heard me right the first time, so I'm going to repeat it again. The historic Beaver House Bait Shop in Grand Marais, Minnesota, Mm -hmm. will become the location of the municipality's city-owned liquor store. I will pause there to allow questions uh, from the uh, the rest of the group before I continue reading the story. Questions? Yes, that would be like if uh, when you go to pay your water bill in Beaver Dam, Mm -hmm. Wisconsin, at City Hall, Mm -hmm. you could also like buy a six-pack of beer? Yeah, you could get some uh, Seagrams, you could get some uh, uh, wine coolers, you can get uh, Mike's Hard Lemonade. This is all legal. In the state of Minnesota, and I know this because a friend of mine mentioned this to me a few years ago, and I was completely flabbergasted by it. I'm surprised it's not on like the top of everyone's uh, conversation. You can be a municipality that uh, raises money to keep down taxes by owning and uh, operating a, a liquor store. Yeah. Yeah, that's completely true. So it's basically like uh, uh, Beaver Dam Mayor Mike Wissell. You go to him and you say, uh, hey, uh, Mayor Wissell, I, uh, the, the condition of the roads is just terrible. And uh, the, the price of a 175 of whiskey is just astronomical. <laughs> so. right? Does this only affect the liquor part of the of the bait shop? Or if you buy night crawlers, is that also funding <laughs> the, the city? How is this working? So now the bait shop is actually closing up. And in, in the Beaver House bait shop is, I, I invite you to go to our... Our Facebook page, which is LA. Our Facebook page is the Great Beaver Fiasco. And you'll be able to see this story and uh, see a picture of the uh, the bait shop that we're talking about because there's like a, a big beaver sculpture like built into the facade of the bait shop. So it's a really cool looking building and the city obviously doesn't want to part with it. So they're using the beaver as bait? 
Well, I guess, yeah, they're using the beaver as bait to bait alcoholics uh, to come in and buy alcohol well, uh, so that they can keep taxes down. But... Well, and those, uh, yeah, and right, teenagers that are going to prom and stuff like that, right? Do they Whatever. sell wine for communion. <laughs> and what? Yes, that, that's an excellent point. Yeah. Communal wine. So, uh, so yeah, they they don't want it to sit empty, so they figure, well, why don't we just move our city-owned liquor store into the bait shop with the big beaver facade? City Administrator Michael Roth quoted as saying in bringmethenews.com that the deal offers an existing location suitable for retail sales and provides an iconic business with resources to put towards an older building. The lease will run through the end of the year with options to go month by month after that. The city-owned liquor store will be up and running by... Drumroll, please. <laughs> Wow, more than I expected. <laughs> the city-owned liquor store in the Beaver Bait Shop uh, will will be opening on April 1st. Yes, that's right. April Fool's Day, but this story is no joke. This is an actual story. Back to you, L.A. So, wait a second, Craig. Okay. Though, did he say, bring me the news or bring me the booze? Ah, that's why, uh, that's why we love her. It's L.A. Bass, everyone. <laughs> That and many other reasons. Beaver Dam, Wisconsin. We end today in Beaver Dam, Wisconsin, in the GBF's recent conversation with newly appointed Mayor Mike Wassell, who tells us his favorite things about Beaver Dam. The thing I like the best is not only the location, but also we have a gorgeous lake. I think a lot of times Beaver Dam Lake is a bit of a, a secret for recreational use and sometimes fishing, too that it's not one of the first places people go and for us locals that's okay and then it's not overpopulated i do like our shopping in, in beaver dam and overall the just the friendliness of, of all of the residents mayor wassell tells the great beaver fiasco that he consciously decided not to mention any specific businesses because he did not want to wind up jinxing them like thomas did with blue boy and have them announce their closure without a new buyer coming forward this was not me at all. Why is that in the story? This was it was not me at all. Zelia mentioned it, I think. Ellie mentioned it, and now you put it into writing. So as far as I'm concerned, it took four people to make this jinx happen. I don't it's, believe in jinxes. Yeah. That's she. Yeah, she doesn't even believe in them. It's just unfortunate that you jinxed the closure of uh, Blue Boy, the the beloved favorite ice cream shop of so many people in the city of Beaver Dam, because you couldn't not talk over me, thus creating that jinx way back two weeks ago, days before it was announced the closure. I can't believe this is happening. Right Where are we going to get our Twinkle Top cones from now? I know. Well, it is. I, I think you could still you could buy it if you want, L.A. Weren't you going to uh, buy it and call it Scoopy Scoops or something? Scary Scoops? Scary Scoops. Yeah, I think yeah. that's a good idea. Spooky Scoops. Spooky, spooky Scoops. Spooky Scoops. That's, that's right. Yeah. Instead anyway, of Scooby Snacks. That's a check of your damn news. And if you love extra sprinkles in your daily routine, check out The Great Beaver Fiasco on Facebook and Instagram. You can also keep up with all our latest videos on YouTube at Supper Club Media. The Great Beaver Fiasco is also on Podbean and Spotify. We'll be right back with our conversation, our big interview, and our big gnaw with our special guest, Annette Camps, right after this. The Ozarks of Arkansas have got Beaver Lake. Uh -huh. Beaver Water's drunk by one in seven in the state. Beaver Dam, Mississippi's a nice duck hole place to have a hot dang beaver darn great damn day. Hi, this is Craig, and on behalf of all of us here at the Great Beaver Fiasco, we want to thank Chris and the good folks at Art on the Town in downtown Beaver Dam for generously furnishing us with a location to record our ridiculously unnecessary podcast. Art on the Town is a studio for creative experiences for all ages, interests, and skill levels. They offer classes. You can paint your own pottery. There's drop-in art-making experiences, exhibition space, you could use their studio and materials for your own creative endeavors. Whether you're looking for fun, creative experiences with friends and family, or are interested in learning how to become proficient at a specific type of art making, Art on the Town at 127 Front Street offers all of that and more. Check them out at artonthetownwi.com. Those of us here at the Great Beaver Fiasco know you'll have a gosh dang beaver darn great damn time at the Art on the Town studio in downtown. Town Beaver Dam. And we're back here on the Great Beaver Fiasco, Episode 3, 
And our uh, special guest has uh, just been a fixture in Beaver Dam for decades and has had a huge impact uh, on the city and on its culture, not to mention uh, its education. We want to welcome Annette Camps to our podcast. Annette, thank you so much for joining us. Those are very, very kind words. Thank you so much. <laughs> pleasure being here. Uh, well, it's a pleasure having you here, Annette. And in the, the young infancy of this podcast, we couldn't think of anybody better to have on the program. Uh, the, the legacy that, uh, that you've left here in the past six decades plus is just simply remarkable and it is 60 years if i'm not mistaken for the beaver dam area community theater a nonprofit, an entity that you had a hand in starting here in the city of beaver dam wisconsin yes in 1964 the summer of 1964 was our first production and it all started actually at the beaver dam high school where i was teaching english and coaching drama and after i i had to sort of retire because I was expecting our first child and at that time schools did not hire pregnant people. Oh, <laughs> oh wow. I was just preparing and looking for what might be next and I think it must have been in maybe May after college had been completed for two young men who came to my door. They had just finished their freshman year in college, Tom Spellman and Chuck Helfert. And they reminded me that I had often talked about how I thought it would be great for Beaver Dam to have a community theater. So they asked me to get it going, and Chuck offered to be the director, and we started, as I said, very humbly. We called a few people together via the newspaper and other sources, and uh, we were fortunate enough to get some people who were you know, very skilled in, in different parts of of the possibility of putting on a production. So we just, without any money, Mm -hmm. (laughs) we just, uh, by faith alone, um, we cast the first show and we found volunteer places to rehearse, which was the Girl Scout house for several years at the Waterworks Uh Park. Yeah, and the first production was especially successful uh, because we credit David Proctor a lot. He was a highly a respected, interesting, humorous, popular person in Beaver Dam who taught at Wayland Academy and very talented, had had actor experience out east, and he played the lead role. Everybody loved him in Beaver Dam, so they all came to see him play the lead role in Harvey. Oh, you did Harvey. Harvey. Yep. Oh. And now you played the invisible rabbit, if I'm not mistaken. (laughs) I was invisible, that's true. It was behind the scenes. We were working on solving all of the challenges that we had without having a place to put on the play. And as I said, no resources. But uh, one gentleman who offered to help was Dick McDermott. And he was a very creative thinker. He went to the uh, movie theater Wisconsin Theater, which had only one theater at the time, and made a deal with the manager there that we could use the movie theater for, I think it was just like one weekend, like maybe Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And uh, and then other challenge was that we had to have a place to rehearse, as I said, at the Girl Scout house, but also a place to build sets. And also how to convert a movie theater that had just a little bit of an apron in front, like a couple feet, into an actual stage. So there were a lot of challenges, but I truly believe that those stories, which we've told over and over again to those who are interested, I think within our community theater group, it it solidified what we were about. And that whole history kind of helped us build the sacrifices and the fun built on what we have today. And it resonates to us having launched this podcast. This again, this is the third podcast that we've we've hosted now. We've torn down, we've put it back together. Our studio. We this we're we're now in a studio that we hope to be in uh, for several episodes here above. uh, We're hoping for two. That'd be we're we're hoping for two at least. Tying the record right now (laughs) here in Doctor Rich's office uh, above Art in the Town in downtown Beaver Dam. Uh, you're no stranger. You In the early days of the Beaver Dam Area Community Theater, you were doing the same thing. You were tearing down, you were setting up, you were tearing down. Give us some insight into that we process. We truly were. I think for the first couple of shows, we were building sets in people's uh, home garages. Oh, wow. And um, the deal at the movie theater was that 
we had to have a tech rehearsal and a final dress rehearsal at at the theater minimum. So just in order to figure out you know, how we're going to set up and uh, how the actors were going to be able to convert what they rehearsed at the um, at the um, Girl Scout house to an actual sort of actual stage. So we had some other volunteers who built this portable stage, and then they contrived a way to extend what was there at the theater by building that portable stage over some of the first seats of the theater. Um, and all of that, the set and the staging, um, needed to be hauled in trucks, Fletcher trucks, loaned us a truck free of charge, and they all had to be loaded up at midnight after the movie was over. And then everyone worked all night and set up the stage, rehearsed, as soon as the staging was up, hopefully by 8 or 9 o'clock, because we had to get out of there again by noon for the afternoon matinee, because the only time we could rehearse was on that Friday night, Saturday morning. So we did that for um, two rehearsals and then went on. <laughs> in the theater forgoes the, the showing of movies during your yes, performances. They did. Yeah, yes, they did. Um, I think it was a plus for them, too. It brought in different people. And the manager there was, um, his last name, his name was Don Perkins. And he was very accommodating. We had a good relationship. And we, I don't think we actually, if we paid rent, it was very minimal. Wow. So, you know, we were we based our whole success on community resources free of charge. And uh, anything that we bought, we paid for after we sold our tickets. So, oh, wow. <laughs> although, you know, we didn't buy much. We were very, very uh, frugal about this. You still had shows. a set. You had a costume. Yeah, we had to have paint and, and wood and things like that. And, and, yeah, and so royalties. I'll L.A. Thomas, I, I hope you're appreciating how much easier our podcast is compared to the all-night, midnight uh, put-togethers and teardowns. To, to these days, Why? well, it, it seems like the, the carpentry was maybe one of the most difficult things to put together. Was that the most difficult thing? What else was a bit of an issue in those early days in 64? In 64? those early days, oh, there were a lot of issues just staging on that theater. For example, you know, we have what we call stage right and stage left entries onto the stage. And we had to be very careful because if we, you know, slashed the screen in any way oh. by all the bypasses. So there, there was a little bit of backstage behind that screen, uh, very little. And that's where the costume changes were done. It wasn't very private. but And then there was a little, it used to be a vaudeville theater. So there was a little, what have been called a makeup room, I guess, kind of on a, it was up a stairs for a little bit. And uh, we had to kind of compete with some uh, guests, a couple of, some rats got, who were in there. Ooh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> and then on the stage right side where we entered, there was some kind of a big generator. Hmm. And so you could, the people who came in from that side had to crawl through and <laughs> over that generator. <laughs> wow. We got Ooh. a little more sophisticated when we started doing musicals because the casts were bigger. So we ultimately, um, another of the good graces, we had a big, it was like a mobile home, and I think one time a tent, and we parked that behind the theater, and then people made their changes and had, had their makeup in there, but then there had to be, you know, some kind of a communication system so we knew when cues were going to happen. And then they had to run outside to get their cues and come into the theater. And sometimes the weather wasn't so great. We did some shows in the winter as well. So it was definitely adventure every time, but it really didn't deter anyone, I don't think, for participating because we always had a lot of fun as well. And this is the uh, the theater building that is still there uh, on Front Street. It's Beaver Dam Cinema now. I think right. it was Rogers Cinema. There was a second cinema in town. Yes, I think on this end of town, across from the museum, maybe. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And again, we're at uh, we're above Art in the Town right now, so we're on the 100 block of, of right. Front Street, and so it'd just be a little bit to our east as we're speaking about it. Right. Bring us then to the the next step. How many years were you um, without a uh, bricks and mortar theater, which, by the way, it's not uncommon for community theaters to not have a bricks and mortar building. Right. The fact that the Beaver Dam Area Community Theater has had 
is it two homes or is it three homes in the last 60 years is really kind of remarkable. And we've had a lot of other homes, too, along the way. Uh, did you own more than three facilities? No, but we we actually begged for several different sites. At one point, the theater was the movie theater was no longer available to us. So we were kind of a tra- traveling company for a while. Okay. We uh, had dinner theater at a restaurant. Oh. We performed in the old mall uh, okay. out on the north side of town. We rehearsed in all kinds of places. The first show that I directed was the first after the Harvey, and that was Arsenic and Old Lace, and uh, mm. kind of reminds me of this because kind of chilly up here. <laughs> it's a little chilly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, we were on a second floor at an old dry cleaning company near the movie theater, and it it was February, and it was a cold February, and there was no heat. Oh, oh my word! Just Ooh. like here. Mm-hmm. What was the downtown like uh, when you when you first established? your your theater was it, you know we know downtown beaver dam went through many changes right. over the years sometimes it was robust in like michigan avenue and and right. sometimes right. you know not so much when in the early days the, the, that first year or two when you're putting on harvey and arsenic and old lace what was the vibe of the downtown um it was pretty strong at that time uh when i first came to beaver dam which was in 1960 um you know There were no malls, all of the stores, all of the restaurants, everything were pretty centralized to the downtown area. Um, It was quite vibrant, actually. And then there was a phase, as you said, where things changed for the downtown. But while in those first years of our community theater, as I said, we depended a lot on resources from stores and so on, owners of stores who sponsored us. And that was all from the downtown area. So, um, yeah, now it's... It's vital again, so it's another good circle. <laughs> did you notice, or did the businesses notice, that uh, when there was a weekend with the uh, productions, that more people came downtown? Did it increase the economic activity when there was a production? I don't know that there's any proof of that. I know that we had full houses all the time. When, and, you did. We, yeah, well, we, and we had limited numbers of um, shows, too, because of the circumstances. But... Um, I'm sure the restaurants were doing very well during that time. I don't think also that people went out to eat as much. I don't yeah. think they did the dinner theater vibe wasn't so great then. But I think people were really excited. I, I know when we did Harvey, we, we did some goofy marketing. We dressed up a bunch of young girls in rabbit costumes <laughs> and oh. had them walk up and down the city street to <laughs> advertise our show. So that's where Hugh Hefner got the idea from. <laughs> Okay. Hey, it all makes right. sense now. After Wisconsin Theater, after we were in a, unable to go there, we did travel around for a while. But even before that, I think just three or four years into our beginnings, we bought a little church, and I think we had a little fun drive for it. It's a, the AAA Church. Uh, oh. Um, it's, at the Allen? Is it on the, uh, yeah. Maple oh. Avenue? We bought that so yeah. that we'd have a place to build our sets and rehearse. It wasn't compatible to having a stage or an audience, mm. but it was a place where we could start to store our costumes and our set pieces. Oh. And I remember many cold nights with a truck pulling up to that door and loading up everything. So we had that for quite a while. <clears throat> and then the Baptist Church, which is only a block or right. two away from the, the right. Eleno. Right. Was that, a, was that a difficult endeavor? Was that a multi-decade, multi-year? Multi- How hard was it to get into that venue? That took quite a while because it required more funding. And um, so we had a major fund drive to buy that building. We've always had a lot of community support, a lot of community leaders who, you know, got on the committees and so on to support it. All of our history is on our website, so if anybody wants specific, I should have printed that out for tonight, but (laughs) not depend on my memory. But um, I think that we were probably 10, maybe 10, 15 years after we started. Wow. That's when, and that's when you got into so. into the think Baptist Church. It was just a decade or two, essentially, before you were finding I think so, maybe 20, I, I think around 15, because our children's theater started just 10 after, years after we began in 1974. And if I recall, we had most of our children's theater events at that 
building. What did that mean to you to have your own your own permanent location? Oh, it was very exciting. I mean, it really gave us authenticity. You know, we, we had a place and we were... Um, and just going back a little bit to how we started, I still give much credit to that first board, particular because we organized right away. We weren't just helter-skelter. We started a constitution bylaws immediately, and that was uh, headed by Tom Wells, who was a very respected Dodge County judge. And he had had a history of theater in Green Bay and the organization of it. And he was a performer. He was in many of our shows or directed. And he offered his services to create a very viable constitution bylaws, which is basically what we still have today. Although, of course, over the years with all the changes, there, there were changes in the bylaws. So you have your own constitution? We have a constitution and bylaws. I have no idea. That's amazing. Do the S's look like F's in your constitution, too? Yeah. So a little constitutional humor there. Sorry. Yeah. But, but every performer and artist wants to be able to share their work with others. And as you said, that a lot of your performances were sold-out shows. Did it surprise you in your fundraising periods? Were you still surprised at how much support you were actually receiving from the community? Did you hear from the street that there was a hunger for performances and live theater in Beaver Dam at that time? Yeah, I do think there was. I think, you know, it's uh, rare for a community of this size to have live theater. And, of course, because it was a small community, so many knew the actors and the people working backstage. So we were really our own marketing team because, you know, we would talk about it and enjoyed it. And we relied entirely on volunteers at that time. Now we have unemployed, a, a small staff, but at that time, for many, many years, we were all volunteer. I, I think up to about, let's see, I was the first managing director that they hired. Um, and that would have been about 25 years ago. But before that, for almost 40 years, it was all volunteer. Wow, that's, that's remarkable. Mm -hmm. As you look back over 60 years, what are your thoughts about this uh, this amazing uh, legacy, this amazing history yeah. that the Beaver Dam Area Community Theater has had in not just Beaver Dam, but South Central Wisconsin? Right, and it's gaining reputation rapidly. We just had a major um, state competition at our community theater. There's a one-act competition, and uh, um, the state organization uh, has you know, recognize the value of our theater, which is a real gem in the state. I don't think there's more than two or three other communi community theaters that own their own building, and some of those are semi-professional. Every time I walk into that building, I can't believe it, to tell mm. you the honest truth. It's, uh, for me, it's extremely rewarding because I have all the history. Mm -hmm. But um, I can, and I can feel the energy when I go into that lobby of the people who are appreciating what we have. And another thing is, we're attracting many more people from out of our community, you know, people from Milwaukee and Madison, and all, even for auditions. You know, community theater sometimes often have the persona uh, uh, due to a lot of, like, movies and so on, that it's just a uh, fun time, you know, but we've always strived to be as professional as we possibly can. And that's why we've really emphasized more and more educational opportunities, which is on the forefront right now. And, uh, and more than ever now, uh, the Beaver Dam Area Community Theater is a force in the city of Beaver Dam. You're in a multi-million dollar state-of-the-art facility uh, that's right in the heart of downtown. In fact, uh, that plays into our, uh, our main topic uh, uh, tonight, mm -hmm. Annette. Uh, we call it our, our big gnaw the here. Big gnaw. Big gnaw. We're going <laughs> we're gonna to be talking about the, uh, the role that uh, culture has had in downtown revitalization in Beaver Dam and, and really anywhere, the importance of that. But we're going to take a break first. Annette Camps, founding member of the Beaver Dam Area Community Theater, our guest here on episode three of The Great Beaver Fiasco. 
Beaverton, Oregon's got the Jenkins Estate. Nearby. Beaver Falls, PA is where Joe Namath first played. Beaver Dam, Wisconsin's where the people all say, have a doggone beaver darn great damn day. Great, great Harvest, harvest bread, bread Company. company. Yes, Great Harvest, a uh, very convenient location right on Front Street. Check out their sandwich of the month. It's always something new and exciting and, and fun each time the calendar changes. And their regular sandwich menu is uh, also amazing. Breakfast sandwiches, lunch sandwiches. My favorite is the roasted red pepper chipotle steak sandwich. Ooh, I love that. Yes. Sounds good. And, you know, they do have a lot of sweet staples like the cinnamon roll, which is delicious. But they also have the sticky bun, which is pecan rolls on a cinnamon roll base. So nummy. And uh, every day of the week, they have something else on the menu. They might be serving brownies one day and then something else, maybe a monkey bread or something the other. You never really know. So check online for your next surprise at Great, Great Harvest, Harvest Bread, bread Company. Company. And we're back with the Great Beaver Fiasco. I'm L.A. Bass. I'm joined with uh... Thomas Rayfeldt. I'm Craig Warmbold, and our uh, special guest here is Annette Camps, a founding member of the Beaver Dam Area Community Theater, and uh, she is joining us for our uh, our Big Gnaw segment here, brought to you by Art on the Town Art Studio, downtown Beaver Dam. We want to thank them for uh, not only sponsoring this segment of the Big Gnaw, but also uh, providing a, uh, a location for us to uh, record and our some podcast. beautiful artwork adorning the walls right. as well. That is not the Prince one, though. We, I don't not think they're going to. No, that they but, don't want. But the flower the up flowers. here, that we see. Well, mm-hmm. Prince is over there. It's funny how that. W- now we don't know who's behind you, though. That's the that's no. the big question. Oh. And that, Mystery the, man, uh, the old the man, the seafaring old man who looks like he just got off the ship. Yeah. I've sometimes told people that he's my grandfather. I don't think anyone believed me, but I found that painting at a antique store in Michigan, and it just has traveled with me ever since. Was it in a downtown uh, part of Michigan? I think it, I think it was. It was in a down, and that's one thing I do love about downtowns is that you do find at least like five antique stores to any other store on the street. It, just the 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 situation with downtowns over the years, over the decades, has, has really been up and down. And um, you know, some communities fare better than others when it comes to uh, uh, to having a vibrant uh, downtown area. Uh, Beaver Dam. I, I if I were to characterize Beaver Dam, Wisconsin's downtown right now, and, and maybe I'll ask you guys your opinions on this. I would say it is among the it is a, a, the most vibrant it's been in the 18 years that I've been here. You would agree, for Annette? Longer. Mm-hmm. For even longer. I, I, you know, when I moved here, celestial season is not celestial seasoning. Cel- <laughs> celestial <laughs> coffee. Uh, tea and coffee. I do remember that building. Yes, yes I took my. Uh, then four-year-old daughter Lily for coffee one Aww. night. Yes. Yeah. Is the it was the old uh, Mason's Lodge. It it had beautiful oh. artwork and architecture, and it was. Uh, and we moved here. And we're like, wow! If a if a community could support a beautiful coffee shop like this, mm-hmm. then this is uh, this is just the right community. And then like a month later, it was uh, yeah. ravaged by floods and torn down. Mm-hmm. But that's a whole different situation. And uh, most downtowns in America, uh, particularly in small towns, medium-sized towns, have gone through uh, through up and downs. Beaver Dam is uh, certainly on an upswing. Uh, no doubt part of that is the investment in that multi-million dollar state-of-the-art facility, which is in the, uh, the old St. Catherine Drexel School Building. Here we are again, 60 years. What are your thoughts about the location of the Beaver Dam Area Community Theater buildings in their time? and the impact that it is that it has had. We actually marketed, part of our marketing for the fundraising was to persuade people that the theater would be a magnet for the downtown. And I think, I mean, there are a lot of people to be credited, a lot of um, entities, businesses, organizations, and uh, our mayor and uh, the city that have all been responsible for rebuilding the downtown. But I do think that um, the theater was a major factor in that. Um, I know from experience in applying for grants, for example, having a theater like ours in the downtown area would be a big plus. Um, so uh, yes, I, I, we sold it at that, and I think it's proven to be more than true. We can't take total credit, but there's so many more restaurant possibities, more coffee shops, like you said. Mm -hmm. Um, 
And that's what you want when you have a theater, too, is for people to have a place now when dinner theater is, dinner and a show is a big deal. It's also a selling plus for the theater because we're working on expanding our audience by offering um, like a package deal for uh, buses to come in to see the show. And of course, if you can give them a list of other things to do, like the Dodge County Art Association and um, Stephen Bennett's plays, all the art on, on the town, all these art attractions that people who go to theater would that would be appealing to them, uh, and many more other things that are happening here. So it's, I think, a mutual benefit. In, in mentioning uh, Stephen Bennett, the Dodge County Center for the Arts, Art on the Town, were you ever in communication talking, like forming together, forming a, a district? Are you talking about what your plans are and how you guys are synergizing what you're doing in the downtown? Actually, I think it evolved um, because um, art on the town didn't exist. I know it was an idea in Christian Macher Rasmussen's head for a long time because we talked about it. And Stephen Bennett was a surprise. He bought our old theater <laughs> building, which was a real advantage for us in terms of income because that was helpful in our building our reconstructing our current building but i think it it just evolved honestly there it would have been great to have that kind of conversation and i think you know certainly there's potential for that kind of conversation in the future i know the city is working on an action plan and so on but um we just it's sort of like when we started we just you know took a chance and believed in what we were doing. It's kind of along the idea of like attracts like. Yes, exactly. In in Art Attracts Art, and you mentioned Stephen Bennett, who we need to make sure we put him on our our guest list of of people to talk to, because what a fascinating guy. This is a guy that does uh, like mosaic portrait-like paintings. Uh, he's, He's done them for celebrities. He's done them for heads of state. The four murals that are on the side of the New state-of-the-art Beaver Dam Area Community mm-hmm. Theater, Fred McMurray, Eric Nancy Kulkerst. Zeman, Eric Kalkhurst, and um, Lois Ehlert. Lois Ehlert, right. the, uh, she is the children's one who does author the, and illustrator. Children's books, mm-hmm. stories, yeah. and illustration, yes. Chicka Chicka Boom yeah, right. Boom. Okay. Right. Yeah. Those were all done by, by Stephen Bennett, who moved into the old Beaver Dam Area Community mm-hmm. Theater building in uh, the old Baptist church, which is in the downtown area. It's part of that downtown right. experience. Mm-hmm. I, I was the executive director for the Art Association at the same time I was managing director for the theater at one point. And we were where the Seipel building is out oh. for many years. And then um, we got kind of dislocated, and they were downtown in a small building that didn't give them much opportunity for exhibits and so on. And then a benefactor gave them this building, as I understand it, mm. which is just perfect because it's right across from the theater. So it just sort of, you know, all of those buildings created the art district. Mm -hmm. And I think our mayor picked up on that and now we have a sign it says it's the art district, and so. Oh, oh, there's a sign that says art district. Yes. Oh, I was not aware. I I know we had talked about it for years. We had always oh. kind of joked about there how you've got. There is a sign. Got, and th- and there is a sign that's. Yeah. I I there's this is sign. the first. Time. Okay, that's on amazing. On a few corners, I think, pointing out. Yeah. Because and it's what's so interesting is to hear about how the synergy happened, but it was really um, happenstance. It, was it, it happened for just sure. by mm-hmm. almost coincidence. Right. But now that that's happened. Hopefully there's potential for even more, you know, artists to come in or art-related businesses and so on. Well, uh, and then the new um, Nancy's Notions right. studio. That's right across that, the street from yeah. us over mm-hmm. here. Um, yeah, it's we share an alley, the theater, and Great Harvest. That's really an advantage, too. That's been mm-hmm. spruced up. Nobody drove through there. Now there's lighting, and you can, you know, people go across that are cast often, it's going across for coffee or whatever and breaks, and it's just really nice. Mm-hmm. I'm kind of thinking of what came first, the alligator or the egg, because if, if you weren't there in 1964, if this scrappy little bunch of uh, plucky individuals that <laughs> volunteered their time to make the theater what it is, mm-hmm. if that wasn't established in 1964, we wouldn't have the art district now. We probably wouldn't have some of the thriving businesses that are surrounding the energy. 
Do you think it's more difficult in 2024 and maybe beyond to to start a thriving art district hmm, that we have now? That's a really interesting question. I hadn't ever th- really thought about that, but I do think the culture was different when we started than it is now. I mean, we're very fortunate. We have wonderful volunteers, I think, to some degree because of the facility that we have. But, you know, typically volunteers are very difficult to find anything long term and and of course we have to train people to do those volunteer jobs too but i wonder it's that's an, i would i would hope not i would hope that there's that energy that will resurface again and just keep our community going but um yeah people have different lives today more women were at home for example there you know there were so many be- behind the scenes things that had to be done organizationally to make everything happen and i was on the phone as much or more than anybody who w- would have been employed and people don't have that luxury anymore it's really was a luxury to have that time to do it well, it's a, it's a good thing that, you know, they were pregnant uh, so yeah. that they were able to stay home <laughs> exactly. and not work their, <laughs> their education exactly. jobs or, or anything like that. That wasn't the plan, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I'm wondering, too, Annette, is there something about the power of theater, of opening up people? Maybe you're reserved, but when you enter the stage, when, this, when the lights hit, some people just turn on a different gear. Do you think allowing a space, especially in a, in a downtown, in a small town, for people to open up, do you think that maybe it helps them engage more within the broader aspects of community? If you open up yourself on stage, are you more likely to go on other parts of downtown? And I do, yeah, especially in you know, the building of confidence. You know, theater is a great confidence builder. I would say, you know, many of those who perform on stage, especially, um, not many, but a good amount, are basically introverts. Mm. And um, I mean, I was kind of like that. <laughs> When you know, growing up in a small town, but I got engaged in theater in high school. My my teacher encouraged me, and that changed me. You know, forever. Mm-hmm. I guess he was responsible for Beaver Dam Area Community Theater in a way. What was his <laughs> well, name? Do you remember? Um, yes, Hoffman. His last name was Hoffman. I'm trying to think of his first name. Well, it was always Mister. You know, yes. of course. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you grew up where again? <laughs> New London, Wisconsin. And you oh. moved here. Why? I got a teaching job here. Okay, and because you weren't pregnant, so apparently, uh, when you got no, it, no, so that's good. To know. <laughs> I wouldn't have gotten a teaching job. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that is just so. That's, that's like when you crazy. go into the uh, school building in the Dodge County Historical Society. They have the list of things that teachers oh. needed to comply with yeah. in the nineteen hundreds. They couldn't show any ankle. They had to let yeah. the superintendent know if they were leaving town. They couldn't date boys. Right. Ooh. They basically had no life outside of school. No, yeah, yeah it's that's shocking true. How, how much things have, have changed. Has the theater, uh, the community, the world of the community theater in general, not Beaver Dam, but as you observe community theater, and I know you go to other community theaters, and mm-hmm. has that changed over in 60 years? Is that same spirit that you had when you put on that first show, that yeah. Harvey at the, the Beaver Dam Cinema, is that the same spirit that's taking the stage over at the new Beaver Dam I think the theater? spirit in our theater or any any theater actually theater people have have to be dedicated because they're not going to make much money even in the professional world and it's just something about it that draws them and makes them happy mm-hmm. so i think you know there are some like i said some community theaters that are sort of semi professional and there are others that you know aren't organized like ours that are just kind of a hit miss organization but i think the the joy of it is the same no matter what you were asking earlier about how the theater contributes to a person's confidence or mm-hmm. whatever i also think another aspect is that theater contributes a lot to building organizational skills mm. and leadership skills of course in our case we have a board and we try to keep it representative of um, theater and business so that there's kind of a balance and we get a community uh, perspective as well as internal perspective. And I think that has a lot to do with our success, actually. But um, there, there's so many skills, like the skills you're using here. Those are skills we teach there or we learn through by doing, you know, the light, the tech work, the 
costuming. There's just, it's like, all of a sudden it's like a mini full life experience. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you can get experience in almost any aspect in theater. When, when we grow up as kids, we're encouraged to play, and that is kind of free form. Mm -hmm. There's not really any rules. Creative drama. Now, now theater is the same <laughs> thing. Theater, you're putting on a play. Is that right. word used the same way of play as kids when putting on a play and performing? I think it must come from the same roots. Uh, of course, it's way back in Shakespearean times, and then the word play has been used then in Greek and, you know, forever. But I don't know if people ever equate it that way, but it's basically... It's not play in terms of just having fun. There's <laughs> <laughs> a lot of work. It's a lot of work. And it's not free form. And it's not, yeah. Well, sometimes you might have improv. Oh, for sure. Ooh. We're going to have a, we have established now that we have improv group at the theater. Wonderful. Oh, really? Yeah. That's just beginning. Um, but the creativity angle, I think that's, that's you know, the same. Yeah. The, what do they always say that, you know, adults ha have to bring back their childhood yeah, brain they in do order say to that. create? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I know it's been 60 years, but do you have one play in particular that was the most fun, your absolute favorite, or one that really just struck a chord with who you are? Well, there are many. I, I In the earlier years, I directed a lot of the shows, musicals and like Dyer Van Frank or comedies or dramas. But the one that has a special meaning for me is our introduction, our premiere of an, an original musical. Um, there was a, a young couple that came to town for a few years who contributed a lot to the arts community, especially the music community. And Chris, who was the uh, the young man was a genius in composing and he had this idea to write a musical about Henry Ford wow and i had always wanted to write something like that my english background and so on so he and i collaborated and i wrote the book and he wrote the music hmm. and we put on a major musical production here any color you like? Any color you like, so long as it's black, which was Henry Ford saying. <laughs> and he wrote beautiful music, and um, yeah, I'm really proud of the story. We actually did get invited to talk to producers in New York about it, oh. and we had higher hopes than what, you know, the, my son's in this business, so I know now <laughs> it's a rare chance <laughs> that anything gets done. But it was also before 9-11. Oh. And um, we had a number of meetings. I went to New York several times with Chris, but then we were told that Broadway was not interested in any dramatic musical because it was too heavy for the time. I'm sure there mm. were other reasons too, but it was mm. so great here. We had we were performing at the high school at that time. We rented the high school's auditorium for a number of years, and um, we actually brought Model T Ford. Wow. right onto really? the stage and I think we were some of the first who used projections we had projections all along uh, for our scene changes and we mm. went to Detroit Michigan and researched and got film and and uh, photos and then we reproduced them and, and keyed them into the scenes mm. and now all that's done technically at that time, we had, I think we, the, the screens were made to look like windows mm -hmm. and the fact of the factory. And then the scene changes were projected from the back by individual slide projectors, oh, by volunteers wow. that had to be synchronized oh, wow. to go with the scene changes and the music mm -hmm. and the dialogue. And we had a guy up in the sound booth who was cueing those volunteers to put up, and they did it perfectly. It was just amazing. We had to rehearse it a lot, of course. But that was really exciting because it was a real creative challenge. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll never forget that. You mentioned there uh, how difficult of an industry it is to be able to make a, even a middle class living in. Mm -hmm. But there have been a number of uh, success stories that mm -hmm. have come out of the, the Beaver yes, Dam Area sure. Community Theater. And, and, you know, even the ones that are immeasurable, those who have gained uh, confidence through public speaking, who went on to be able to speak to rooms full of uh, people sure. as, as part of their job, not necessarily mm -hmm. related to theater, mm -hmm. but those that were able to take root in the world of theater or the world of cinema, mm -hmm. 
what are your thoughts about that? Well, the first thing that comes to my mind is that our current managing director, David Smith, is a perfect example of that. Yep. We interviewed, I think it was 13 or 15 potential managing directors. The position had been established maybe 15 years ago, something like that. He was the third managing director, and we interviewed 13 or 15 people, not just from Wisconsin, but we had applications from all over. And we had some really excellent applications. We were very pleased. It was a, a difficult to you know, siphon out which ones we would give the final interviews to. And one of them was David Smith. Turns out that he was the most qualified, most pleasant application of a whole bunch. He started in our Teletale Theater, went on to be in some of our shows, became a professional actor, moved to Minneapolis, was in a number of different TV series in Hollywood. And movies. Uh, and movies. And he re just recently came back, and he hadn't known about you know, that call, but he read about it, and he applied. And uh, he had just bought a house here, so it was just serendipity that he happened to be here, and of course, then there's the insurance that he will be around for a while too. And um, we were just so excited that he came back with all that history and was so highly qualified. So that's a good example. It's a perfect example, and it's not the only one either, which is the remarkable no, thing. And it's not all on stage, it's not all on the screen. Right, right, uh, absolutely. And you may recall that for a while we were doing a series called Roots and Wings. Yep. And we would invite, you know, there were opera singers and writers and um, performers, I mean, people in all aspects of the theater. And uh, we did a series featuring each of them, and they came back and performed for, you know, special programming. And just for us to say, look what we did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot, of, a lot of wonderful people have gone through our community theater. Let's wind down this topic by asking you to give us just your thoughts about the impact that um, that theater has had on the Beaver Dam community. Well, I hope there's a real sense of pride from the community. I think it's, like we talked about earlier, contributed to people's resolve to pursue their talents and their skills, and, and the community has always been so supportive. I mean, we have always had a list long list of patrons and of course the fundraising we never thought I mean we our aspirations was to we have no debt with that theater and we've only had it for five years of course we have costs we're investing in other kinds of shows that we're bringing in from the outside um, and we have maintenance of that beautiful building and there are still some aspects of the building that we need to work on. Like, for example, on the second floor, which is sort of a studio theater, a uh, meeting place, there's the potential for a nice little kitchen in the back. So there are things in our theater that we're still working on and, you know, are looking for funds for. But to be where we are financially so that we can sustain and build that's due to all of our community support. Wow. What a remarkable story uh, from Annette Camps here, founding member of the Beaver Dam Area Community Theater. But not the end of the segment, not as we are all. introducing a new segment. Tell them about it, if you would. L.A. Thomas. Well, we have <laughs> next to you, Annette, as uh, you, you were kind of uh, <laughs> touching it earlier and spilled it out. We have a bowler hat next to you. Okay. I didn't even know bowling people wore hats. <laughs> Oh. It is it is the height of fashion in 1890, right. and we have it loaded up with a bunch of random questions, and we want you to just reach in, pull one, and if you can read the handwriting, that'll be one challenge. <laughs> oh, okay. Let's see what your question Let's is. see what it is. Well, you wrote that with a magnifying glass, it looks like. What animal would you most want to turn into? <laughs> <laughs> That's the very first one I wrote down. Who's supposed to answer this? Yeah, you, you are. are. <laughs> You're a special guest. That's yeah, easy ah. for me. You know, I just read a wonderful book called West with Giraffes. Oh, okay. And I've always thought giraffes are so beautiful. 
So I think it'd be a giraffe. Oh, wow. Yeah. I thought you'd go with Invisible Rabbit, but giraffe is a good one, too. <laughs> yeah, it's a beautiful story based on truth about how an elderly gentleman and his companion drove two giraffes from the East Coast to the West Coast. You gotta watch During those overpasses. The, dur- <laughs> yeah, well, that's another story in Beaver Dam too. But um, during the d- depression years, really? and uh, fascinating story, huh. and all the you know challenges they faced along the way with people and weather. And yeah, I'm sorry. What's the Beaver Dam giraffe overpass story? Oh, Is there? I, I'm not going to share. That <laughs> there's a there's a Beaver dra- Dam giraffe. Breaking news. Well, I can't even say it. <laughs> there is a story about a giraffe. <laughs> An overpass I don't in the know city enough of, of the there? specific details mm. to share that, but there was a gentleman who um, raised exotic animals and out just north of Beaver Dam. Oh, you're kidding me! Mm-hmm. And a giraffe was in among fact, them. I think uh, was it a cheetah or a leopard that got loose at one time around the. Oh, country. I think I know what you're. That? Yeah, I know what you're talking yeah. about. There were really? kangaroos as well. Beaver Dam yeah, made an alligator. Oh no, that's a different thing. Oh, that was that. Were not the same no, ones. No, okay, this is All right. way before that. Oh, it was. How many exotic animals do we have in this area? Do you know anything about? I think it was before your time. Uh, Monkey Island in the city of Beaver Dam. Yeah, well, that was in the Swan Park. Yes, right. Yeah. right? Yeah. Sure, that was there when my kids were little. Oh, really? you're kidding? Really? Yeah. Uh-huh. So what kind of monkeys? They must have been old world monkeys. I don't know what kind of, I'm not really an expert in monkeys. Oh. Those are little, you know, the small well, ones. Well, do they have tails? Jumper. Yeah. Old world monkeys. So you would, uh, what is an old world monkey? I never heard of I've that never, term That is a new monkeys. term. It's like my wife calls squirrels ground squirrels. Like all squirrels are on the ground, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, I don't understand they trees. why the, wait, new world monkeys have tails too, but they have prehensile oh, tails. Oh, I'm, So they can actually again, use their tails. I, I, I am dyslexic. I truly am. So thank you, Thomas, for clarifying that because the producer was having a monkey fit back there. <laughs> Well, we have a whole monkey of islands. What was it like as a parent then to go to Swan Park? You would just observe the monkeys they, on the they, island they, in they the lagoon? They had some kind of a fencing around them. You know where that <laughs> playground is now in Swan Park. That's where they were. Really? Oh. That's oh. where it was. So it was, because I guess when it was island, I always thought it was near like the ponds. No, I, as I remember it, which was a long time ago, it was on the, yeah, where that stone wall is, you know, mm-hmm. and where the basketball court yeah. is in that oh, area. That's where okay, my so it wasn't in the middle of the lagoon. Huh. It was, yeah. No, but there is thought. a story about how the swans were killed in the lagoon, Ooh. too. Oh. Well, first of all, we've got Roger Knoll, local yeah. historian Roger Knoll, joining I, us so on, he, on next week's right, podcast. So we'll say that. And he's going to talk about Monkey Island. He's going to talk about a few other things, but we have we should ask him then about ask him about the swans and the giraffe. The swans and the giraffe. <laughs> I've got we've got so much got a lot to of go. Notes here. I'm, my <laughs> my mind is blown. Got a whole we've got a whole island of monkeys. Well, it just kind of goes to show that the digger you deep into a small town. Need backup. Oh, monkey of islands. Oh, oh, monkeys. The digger you deep into a small town. Affirmative. Proceed. Well, it just kind of goes to show that the digger you deep into a small town, because it's a little deceiving small town, there's not going to be much there, but you just start lifting away, lifting away, mm-hmm. and you find all these rich stories right underneath. Mm-hmm. There are a lot. Yeah, I've met a lot of fantastic people during my life here in Beaver Dam. Yeah. And and there are historical people, too, who went way beyond the small community to be very successful. And you told a lot of stories in those 60 years, and that on the stage and behind the scenes, and right here tonight. Oh. And we want to we want to thank you so much for uh, for joining us on the uh, the program. It's 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 really been absolutely wonderful. It's been a blast. It has been. Well, yes, it was thank very you. Very enjoyable. Thank you for your interest. Well, thank you for coming on to our third podcast ever. I don't even know how to dismount from this one. We got Monkey Island, we've got giraffes, we've got kangaroos, uh, we've got 60 years of art and culture here in the uh, city of Beaver Dam, and we're looking forward to exploring much more in depth all of these topics and more next week on the Great Beaver Fiasco. Our guest will be local historian Roger Knoll, who, in addition to talking about Monkey Island uh, or Monkey Cage or Monkey Basketball Court, whatever it is, uh, he's going to talk about the thing that we talked about in an earlier your podcast with Zelia Edgar, who didn't get to pick a question out of a, a, oh, a bowler hat. She'll have to so you come were the back. the first one, Annette. Well, yeah, we'll have to get her back for that. He's going to talk about the story of the spaceship uh, that rose up out of Beaver Dam Lake in right, 1882 yeah. or whatever the it was. It was printed in the, mm-hmm. the paper at the time. And he's going to give us 
the history of Beaver Dam in five minutes or less. Five <laughs> minutes, Roger Noel. Mm, it's going to take him all week expert, to prepare that. That's for sure. Only right here on The, the Great, Great Beaver, Beaver Fiasco. Beaver Dam's New York is where the dead once played. Nearby. Beaver Dam, Wisconsin's where Fred McMurray was raised. Beaver Dam, anywhere's a great place to stay and have a gall dang beaver, beaver darn great, great damn day. day. Beaver Dam, Wisconsin's got peonies and parades. Beaverton, Oregon's where shoes are made. Sorta. Beaver Dam, everywhere the people all say, have a gosh, gosh dang, dang beaver darn great, great damn day. day.